Welcome to the proteomics course. Today we will talk about proteins, its folding and misfolding. Understanding the processes of protein folding and misfolding have been a major research area from last several decades in biology, chemistry and physics. Understanding protein folding and misfolding remains challenging and continues to motivate researchers to work both experimentally and theoretically in this area. In today's lecture, I will present and discuss the basics of protein folding, how this process works and how misfolding may result into various manifestation of diseases. As we talked in the last class, proteins play a very crucial role in essential characteristics of living systems, how they function, how they replicate themselves through the intricate molecular interactions. Proteins are most important classes of molecules which are involved in promoting and regulating essentially all the reactions which takes place in living systems. We discussed previously the globular proteins they can fold into conformations of ordered secondary and tertiary structures. The interactions which govern the formation of secondary, tertiary and quaternary structures involve different forces and interactions. The cumulative effect of all of these interactions and forces are such that the folded proteins, the magnitude of the favorable reactions or interactions will be outweighing the sum of unfavorable interactions and as a result it governs the protein folding. So, in today's lecture, we will talk about how amino acid sequence determines three dimensional protein structure. I will explain you a classical experiment done by Anfinson. We will talk about how protein folding occurs, some of the basic thermodynamics of protein folding concepts, how molecular chaperones govern the protein folding process and how protein misfolding may result into various diseases. So, let us start with our first topic. Amino acid sequences determines three dimensional structure of proteins. So, there is very intricate sequence structure relationship. The amino acid sequence dictates the conformations which are adopted by the polypeptide chains at secondary and tertiary levels. Scientist Anfinson, he did a classical experiment where he tested the ability of reduced and unfolded proteins to spontaneously fold into native state by using a protein ribonuclease A. The experiment established that the primary amino acid sequence of a protein contains all the information which is required for the proper protein folding into its native form. The fundamental discovery of Anfinson led him to receive the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1972. So, let me explain you how this experiment worked. To establish the proof for relationship between amino acid sequence and its conformation, Christian Anfinson in 1950s performed an experiment where he performed two steps denaturing and refolding. 
So, how denaturation and refolding works? So, in this classical experiment, Enfinson used protein ribonuclease A. He used few denaturants such as urea or guanidine hydrochloride and beta mercaprethanol, which breaks the disulfide bonds. So, let us look at each one of these component in little bit more detail. First talk about ribonuclease A protein. So, this protein has contributed greatly to our understanding of protein folding in vitro from the landmark experiment of Enfinson. As you can see in the structure, ribonuclease has 124 amino acid residues and it forms 4 disulfide bridges which are located between the 16 residues of 26 and 84, 40 and 95, 58 and 110 and 65 and 72. This protein catalyzes the hydrolysis of RNA. So, what is the role of urea and guanidinium chloride? Urea is an organic compound which has two amino groups joined by a carbonyl group and used at a concentration of around 6 molar for denaturing the proteins by breaking the non-covalent interactions. Both urea and guanidinium chloride can effectively disrupt the proteins non-covalent interactions. What is the role of beta mercaptoethanol? The beta mercaptoethanol is commonly used to reduce the disulfide linkages in proteins and thereby it disrupts the tertiary and quaternary structures. As you can see in the structure here in the slide, in presence of excess of beta mercaptoethanol, the disulfide or cysteines can be fully converted into sulfhydryls or cysteines. So, in Enfinson's experiment, he used 8 molar of urea and beta mercaptoethanol treatment, which converted the native proteins to fully reduce state into the randomly coiled polypeptides known as the denatured structure. The denatured polypeptide lacked enzymatic activity. So, as we have discussed the ribonuclease protein, it contains 124 amino acid residues and forms 4 disulfide linkages. These linkages are formed between the cysteines as shown here of 26, 84, 40 and 95, 58 and 110 and 65 and 72. The ribonuclease native conformation is lost when it was treated with 8 molar urea and beta mercaptoethanol. As you can see here, the native ribonuclease has formed denatured reduced ribonuclease due to the breaking of disulfide and non-covalent interactions. So, on treatment of urea and beta mercaptoethanol, ribonuclease A protein lost its native conformation because of breaking of disulfide and non-covalent linkages. Enfinsus noticed that when the ribonuclease was oxidized in air and urea was removed by the process of dialysis, the enzyme activity slowly recovered and as a result of the protein folding. As you can see here, if you have used beta mercaptoethanol and 6 molar urea, all the disulfide and covalent bonds are breaking. Once urea is removed, then slowly 
protein folding occurs. It results into the reformation of tertiary structure and active site. When Enfinson repeated this experiment in presence of denaturant urea, that led to regeneration of less than 1 percent of enzyme activity. So, what could be the reason? In fact, urea prevented the correct disulfide pairing which resulted into the scrambled form, scrambled ribonuclease. Now, if you mathematically calculate due to the presence of 4 disulfide bonds here and presence of 8 cysteine residues, it can actually give rise to 105 different forms in which these 4 disulfide bonds can be formed. So, in the absence of urea, the correct disulfide bridge formation occurred and it allowed folded and thermodynamically a stable state to be reached in ribonuclease protein. Now, this figure shows here that in presence of trace amount of beta mercaptoethanol and complete removal of denaturant urea, the refolding of ribonuclease was accurate and four intra-chain disulfide bonds were reformed in the same positions where they were expected in the native ribonuclease. The random distribution of disulfide bonds was obtained when denaturants were used as you can see in the scrambled state, which indicates that weak bonding interactions were required for the correct positioning of disulfide bonds and achieve the native confirmation. So, in Enfinson's experiment, he removed urea and beta mercaptoethanol by dialysis process. The denatured ribonuclease regained its enzyme activity. The enzyme was refolded into the active form and the sulfhydryl groups became oxidized in presence of air. The experiment proved that information required for a specific catalytic active structure of ribonuclease is contained in its amino acid sequence. The classical study of Enfinson proved that all the information which is crucial for protein folding resides in its primary sequence. Let me explain you this experiment in following animation. In Enfinson's experiment, ribonuclease A in its native state has 4 disulfide bonds between its cysteine residues. When treated with beta mercaptoethanol and 6 molar urea, the protein undergoes denaturation and the disulfide linkages are broken. The enzyme activity is lost in its denatured state. It was observed by Enfinson that removal of urea and beta mercaptoethanol led to the refolding of enzyme to assume its native state with more than 90 percent enzyme activity being intact. However, if only beta mercaptoethanol was removed in presence of urea, the formation of disulfide bonds was random, which led to enzyme with only around 1 percent activity. So, after studying the classical experiment of Enfinson, let us talk about protein folding. Understanding the mechanism by which protein folding takes place it still remains challenging for the scientific community. Protein folding provides an elegant example of biological self assembly and understanding such complex machinery.
provides very critical information not only for the understanding of protein folding, but also the evolutionary aspects of proteins and various biomolecules. In protein folding, the amino acid sequence determines the three dimensional structure. Now, as you can see here, the proteins having very much specificity. If you have an amino acid sequence 1 shown in blue color, that will form protein 1 shown in the right side. If you have amino acid sequence 2 shown in red, that will form protein 2. Now, if you take the amino acid sequence 1, protein 2 cannot be generated. Similarly, if you take amino acid sequence 2, protein 1 cannot be generated. So, there is very high specificity of amino acid sequence which can determine the three dimensional structure of proteins. The protein folding process is governed by distribution of polar and nonpolar amino acids. If you remember last class, we have talked about various amino acids. The polar side chains, they tend to arrange themselves near outside of the molecules. You take for example, arginine, glutamine, histidine. Similarly, on the non-polar side chains, they have tendency to cluster in the interior of molecules. For example, phenylalanine, leucine, valine and tryptophan. This chart is only for your information, which shows the various amino acids which belong to polar and non-polar category. And then you can think of how they are going to govern the protein folding process. So, continuing on protein folding, the hydrophobic amino acids they are driven to associate the hydrophobic collapse. So, when these amino acids come together, as you can see on the right hand side, the loss of water surrounding these amino acids increases entropy of the system. Therefore, overall increase in an entropy drives the folding process. Now, as you have seen in the classical experiment of N. Finson, the protein unfolding can be done by using denaturants. So, if you take denaturants whether it is chemical like urea and gonadinium chloride or you heat treat it. So, as you can see here, if you have a purified protein isolate taken from the cells and you expose it to the high concentration of denaturants whether it is chemical or heat that will result into the denatured protein shown in the center. If you remove the denaturing condition, it will again form the proper folding, protein conformation will be restored in its original form. So, how this process of folding to unfolding works? The various hypotheses and mechanism have been proposed. Let us talk about cooperative transition here from folding to the unfolding form. As you can see in this graph, on the y axis, the protein in the unfolded form from 0 to 100 and on the x axis, the presence of denaturant. A sharp transition from the native or the folded to the denatured or unfolded forms occur. So, only two conformational states are present significantly, whether it is folded form or unfolded form. If denaturants are removed from the unfolded protein, it allows protein to make folded forms. So, what are the components of partially denatured protein? If you look at this graph, in the transition state at 50 percent, it will be 50 percent fully folded 
and 50 percent unfolded form of the protein. However, existence of only two states the folded and unfolded or possibility of unstable transient intermediates between the folded and unfolded states it still remains a topic of research in protein folding area. So, how folding occurs from many conformations to only one form? The particular sequences along the polypeptide backbone they impose key restrictions. The various properties of the side chains which we have talked in the previous lecture including size, hydrophobicity, ability to form hydrogen and ionic bond all of these govern this process. Let us take example of arginine. A side chain with positive charge might attract a segment of the polypeptide which has complementary negative charge. You take for example, aspartic acid. So, these type of side chains and various type of backbone properties are going to impose key restrictions. Therefore, various type of folded conformations will be selected and it can result only the one which is going to govern the folding process. So, there are various progressive stabilization of intermediates occur in the folding process. As we talked folding is a cooperative process which involves progressive stabilization of various intermediates. In general any protein adopts only one conformation which we just talked in the last slide or few very closely related characteristic functional conformations may occur which will give rise to the native state. Native state in this context here will be the conformation which has the lowest free entropy or the most stable folded form for majority of the proteins. So, let us see in this slide how cooperative transition occurs from the folding to unfolding. Folding is a cooperative process which arises from simultaneous formation of multiple interactions within a polypeptide chain. If you take individually, so each interaction is weak, but their cooperative formation drives polypeptide chains towards the folded state. So, how to do a structural prediction of proteins? As we have seen in the previous experiment, the amino acid sequence dictates the protein structure. So, theoretically the prediction of final folded structure is possible from its sequence. However, there are long range of interactions and vast number of possible conformations which are possible and therefore, it limits these type of predictions. However, knowledge based and AP initio from the beginning prediction do take place to predict the protein structure. So, let me show you the protein folding process in following animation. The process of protein folding is dictated by the distribution of polar and non-polar amino acid residues in the protein. The hydrophobic amino acids are driven to interact with one another by a process known as hydrophobic collapse. They come together and during this process eliminate water molecules surrounding them. The polar residues remain on the surface and form hydrogen bonds with water molecules while the hydrophobic residues get buried within the core of protein. Protein folding is a cooperative process whereas, the unfolding is a sharp and quick transition. Proteins typically adopt only one 
characteristic functional native state conformation which has lowest free energy and it is most stable. Folding is limited to one conformation due to properties of the amino acid side chain such as hydrophobicity, size, shape etcetera. Folding is highly cooperative process wherein there is progressive stabilization of the intermediates as you can see here. Although it is theoretically possible to predict the protein structure from the amino acid sequence, several long range interactions can often limit such predictions. Here on x axis denaturants are plotted and y axis the percentage protein unfolded is plotted. On 0 you can see that is totally folded form of the protein, on 100 percent it is unfolded form. But if you take a mixture from 50 percent that is either unfolded or folded form which shows that protein can assume either folded form or unfolded form of the proteins. Let us now talk about thermodynamics of protein folding. The folding of proteins into their native conformations occur spontaneously under physiological conditions and is dictated by the primary structure of the protein. Protein folding is thermodynamically favorable process where decrease in free energy from unfolded to folded state occurs. So, let us talk about some of the basics of thermodynamics for protein folding. As we have seen earlier the hydrophobic amino acids they are driven to associate hydrophobic collapse. Therefore, overall increase in an entropy drives the folding process. As you can see in this complex picture here the folding process can be explained as free energy funnel thermodynamically. If you look at the right hand side the open mouth of funnel represents the wide range of structures which are accessible to the ensemble of denatured proteins. The initial collapse state of protein with very little thermodynamic stability is known as molten globule. The amino acid side chains are extremely disordered in this state and several fluctuations can be observed as you can see from these arrows. As free energy of protein molecules decreases, the protein molecules move down to the narrower part of the funnel. Look at the bottom part here and only few conformations can be accessible here. So, at the bottom of the funnel well defined and folded conformation states are present. So, if you look at unfolded polypeptide chain, so the amino acids that have been joined together by the peptide bonds, but they have not yet formed their secondary or tertiary structure. So, this conformation has highest free energy and entropy. The amino acids in the polypeptide chain start interacting by means of hydrogen bonds across the polypeptide backbone in order to initiate the folding process. The free energy and entropy of the system gradually decreases as folding takes place. The entropy of the polypeptide chain decreases during this process. So, in the thermodynamic terms the lowering of entropy is favored by a corresponding increase in entropy in the surroundings composed of the water molecules. Now, if you look at the funnel again as the protein continues to fold 
in order to assume its stable low energy native state conformations, the entropy also decreases, while it may appear unfavorable for the system. However, entropy of the surrounding water molecules increases in this process and it increases overall entropy and makes it favorable and spontaneous. So, let me show you how protein folding works and how it can be described in the thermodynamics terms in following animations. An unfolded polypeptide chain has very high energy and entropy. The protein folding acts to decrease the free energy of the system by forming favorable re interactions and assuming a more stable state. The entropy of the polypeptide chain decreases during this process as the protein continues to fold in order to assume a stable low energy native state conformation the entropy also decreases as the protein continues to fold in order to assume a stable low energy native state conformation the entropy also decreases while this would seem unfavorable for the system it must be recalled that the entropy of the surrounding water molecule increases during the process thereby increasing overall entropy and making it favorable and spontaneous. Let us now talk about molecular chaperones for protein folding. The molecular chaperones are class of heat inducible proteins which provides kinetic assistance in protein folding process. They prevent protein aggregation and promote protein folding by binding to the hydrophobic surfaces which are exposed in non native protein conformations. So, let us talk about various molecular chaperone systems. Many newly synthesized proteins form folded structures in vivo spontaneously and without any assistance. However, folding efficiency could be limited by various processes such as protein aggregation which are promoted by the transiently exposed hydrophobic surfaces. In response to the heat shock, the cells produce significant amount of unfolded proteins by synthesizing new systems which are known as molecular chaperones which are designed to promote the protein folding process. There are several molecular chaperone systems which have been exemplified in E. coli includes Groyel, Groyel system, DNAK, DNAJ, GRPE and CLPB. The bacterial chaperonin Groyel it binds proteins in non native states and allows enzymes to be recovered quantitatively in native form by binding which requires co chaperonin Groyes and ATP. Let me show you how this chaperonin works and govern the protein folding process in following animations. The unfolded protein is bound by DNAJ and then by DNAK which is an ATP bound protein. The hydrolysis of ATP into ADP and PI by DNAK is stimulated by DNAJ. This resulting DNAK ADP remains tightly bound to the unfolded protein. The nucleotide exchange factor GRPE present in bacteria facilitates release of ADP along with DNAJ. This leaves the DNAK bound to the 
partially folded protein which continues to undergo folding to a more favorable low energy conformation. Once the protein gets completely folded, it gets detached from DNA K which then binds ATP again and completes the cycle and prepare it for next round of protein folding. Any protein which may not have been folded completely is then taken over by the Groyal chaperonin system which completes the folding. After talking about how protein folding works, let us discuss about protein misfolding and how misfolding may result into various diseases. So, protein misfolding results into large number of human diseases which arise as a consequence of protein misfolding. In protein folding, mutations cause defective folding, aberrant assembly and incomplete processing which results into altered folding properties. Proteins fold into a single energetically most favorable conformation which is specified by its amino acid sequence. A protein may fold into alternative three dimensional structures because of mutations or inappropriate covalent modifications. Therefore, protein misfolding may lead to loss of normal protein function. So, in this slide we can see from a newly synthesized protein it could have various fate. It may form the proper folded form without any assistance or it can give correct folded forms in presence of molecular chaperones or incompletely folded forms can be digested by proteasome machinery or it may result into the protein aggregation. So, a neurosynthesized protein may give rise to any one of these forms depending on various factors which are going to govern the protein folding process. So, accumulation of these misfolded proteins or proteolytic fragments can result into few degenerative diseases. These degenerative diseases are characterized by the presence of insoluble protein plates in organs such as brain and liver. For example, Alzheimer's disease in human as well as Parkinson's disease, bovine spongiform encephalopathy also known as mad cow disease in cows and scrappy disease in sheep. So, in this slide it is shown that amyloid fibers are involved in neurodegenerative diseases and the protein aggregation due to the large beta sheets are deduced from solid state NMR. In Alzheimer's disease the presence of beta amyloid containing plaques is associated with neurodegeneration and dementia. In other neurodegenerative diseases it has also been shown that it involves protein aggregation. Prion diseases such as Jacob's disease and BSE or bovine spongiform encephalopathy are associated with amyloid deposit of PRP proteins. So, how insoluble protein aggregates can result into various diseases? Let us discuss some of protein misfolding related disease in following animation. Protein misfolding results into various diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, a structure of certain normal soluble cellular proteins which are normally rich in alpha helical regions are converted into 
beta strand conformations, which further link with each other to form beta sheet aggregates known as amyloids. The insoluble amyloid plates are essentially made up of single polypeptide chain or fibrils known as amyloid B protein. It is observed in the brain of patients with Alzheimer's where dead or drying neurons are surrounded with plates. The neurotoxicity is believed to be caused by the amyloid fibrils before they get deposited as amyloid plates. This disease presents various symptoms such as memory loss, decreased neuromuscular coordination, confusion and dementia. Jacob disease It was initially believed to be caused by viruses or bacteria. However, later it was discovered to be transmitted by a small proteins known as prions. The prion proteins are composed of beta sheet structures that have been modified from previously existing alpha helices. The protein aggregates of one abnormal protein is sufficient to function as a nuclei for other normal proteins to attach. Huntington's disease It is a neurodegenerative disorder of genetic origin which affects muscular coordination. It is caused by increased number of trinucleotide repeats CAG in Huntington gene leading to increased number of glutamine residues incorporated in corresponding protein. This alters the folding of Huntington protein which has highest concentration in brain and testis. The exact function of this protein is unclear, but it is known to interact with several other proteins. The mutated protein has also been found to have effects on chaperone proteins which in turn helps to fold several other proteins. Cystic fibrosis this is an autosomal recessive disorder caused by mutation in gene for the protein cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator or CFTR. The CFTR gene regulates components of sweat, digestive juices and mucus. It is caused by a deletion of three nucleotides leading to the elimination of a phenylalanine residue from the protein and therefore results into abnormal folding. The dysfunctional protein gets degraded by the cell. Pulmonary emphysema It is a progressive disease of lung which causes shortness of breath. It can be caused by deficiency of the protein alpha 1 antitrypsin or A1AT. The A1AT gene is responsible for protection of lung tissue from damage by enzyme neutrophil elastase. Abnormally secreted A1AT gets accumulated in liver thereby allows lung tissue damage. The disease results into wheezing, shortness of breath and asthma like symptoms, lethargism. It is regular ingestion of seeds from sweet pea, lethyrus odoratus which causes disruption of cross linking 
in muscle protein collagen. Collagen is very important structural protein which has triple helical structure. The cross links formed are due to the oxidation of lysine residues by the enzyme lysyl oxidase to form allicine. These are essential for proper folding of collagen and giving it the required strength. B amino propionitrile present in abundance in sweet pea deactivates this enzyme by binding to its active site. This prevents cross linking and proper folding of the protein. It may also result in muscle fragility and weakness. So, in summary today we talked about a classical experiment of Enfinson which has proved that all the information which is crucial for protein folding resides within the primary amino acid sequence. We then talked about protein folding and how various polar and non polar side chain restrict and govern the process of protein folding. We then looked at the thermodynamics of protein folding albeit very briefly we talked about entropy and how it governs the protein folding. The molecular chaperones we talked about some classical example in animations and then we discussed about protein misfolding and described some of the diseases which may result due to the protein misfolding. We will continue our discussion about basics of protein structure and function in next class as well. Thank you.